they will finish up that conversation on strain gauges uh, and talk a bit about elasticity. So uh, just isotropic linear elasticity. And then um, Friday we'll have a recitation by the TA for, for the lab. I'll also talk a bit in the beginning about error analysis. Next week, I'll actually be gone Monday, Tuesday. We'll have makeup lectures by the TA. We'll be talking about viscoelasticity. And next week, your lab demo, the next week will be a lab demo, and it'll be by the TA also on viscoelasticity. So the TA will, Serwin will be coming in to give two lectures on Monday, Tuesday, and holding a lab that week. So I already apologize to him for the amount of stuff that he's going to have to do all in a row. But uh, so before we get started, real quick, maybe two, three more people introduce themselves, say who you are, what you're interested in, what you hope to take away, <coughs> and we can dive into things. Or not. <laughs> no pressure. Okay, that's also co totally cool. Um, can you see the board all right? Is that fine? We might want to close the close the blinds in the back. I know. I'm just trying to make it seem more like you're trapped in a cage while you're in here. Okay, a little bit better. Cool. So yesterday. Or, yeah, yesterday we talked about strain, strain gauges. So let's finish up that conversation on strain gauges. So strain gauges are metallic foils that are woven into this accordion pattern. They only sense strain axially. So sense strain along one direction, which means in our strain tensor, they're only measuring one component. Y, Y x y x y they're only measuring this one component so in order to measure multiple or strains in other directions we have to throw in multiple strain gauges in different directions so normally we do that with a strain gauge rosette so we would have three normally three strain gauges oriented at different angles relative to each other either 0 45 90 or 0, 120, 240, or 0, 60, 120. I think all of them are somewhat common. This one, I think the 0, 45, 90 is probably the most common. 0, we're going to call this one A, B, and C. And this one still has those gauges, or the, the strain lines aligned with the direction of the gauge. So when we have this, the reason we have those three gauges is because we need those three to fully fill out what are uh, effectively our Moore's strain circle. So let's go back to that Moore's strain circle. Do, do, do. And let's actually throw some numbers on there and some equations. So here now, I know for a 0, 45, 90 strain gauge, if I'm going to have some center point, I can have one strain gauge oriented this way, the other one's going to be oriented at 45 degrees, and the other one, or 45, which in the Moore's circle is 90 degrees, because uh, this is a 2 theta, so 45 degree relative to each other is 90 here, and that um, these, so that these form kind of this 90 degree right angle. Now what I'm doing in laying it up this way is so my, my strain gauge can only measure this axial strain and I want to figure out what the full strain in the body is. So here by I'm basically going to get out these three points my epsilon A, epsilon B, and epsilon C from my strain gauges and I want to use those to figure out what this circle is going to be so that I can later figure out what my principal strains are. So you can see, can you see? Is it still a little washed out? Do we need to close the other blind? Get even more dungeon? Is this fine? Okay, cool. So 
you can see from the diagram that A and C here are on opposite sides of this center point C of the circle. Yeah. Better, maybe. Uh, cool. Are on opposite sides of the center point C of the circle. So we can actually find the center point of the circle by finding the average between that epsilon A and epsilon C. So my center point is the average between epsilon A, epsilon C over two. And then the radius of the circle, I can use geometry to figure out where these things are. There's a, there's a couple trig relationships that I can throw in here, uh, but I'm just gonna give you the end result which is, I can figure out the radius of that circle as one half A minus epsilon B uh, squared plus one half epsilon B minus epsilon C squared. There we go. So you can tell there's some sort of a, a Pythagorean E identity in there. If you want to go through the math, you're welcome to, but uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through it here. So now, if I want to figure out what my, what my principal strains are, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, and also now, uh, notation-wise, I'm going to call this gamma over 2, Ooh, because I'm going to remind you now, when I am defining this strain here, this epsilon xy, this is my shear strain, which is actually half of my engineering strain, which I'm defining as that uh, angle that I shear a body in pure shear gamma. So this is equivalent to my gamma over two, gamma over two, gamma over two. I don't know if this is actually on the board right now. No, it's not. Cool. Uh, so just remember this relationship between engineering shear strain and shear strain. So I'm going to call this a gamma over 2 or just an epsilon xy um, here. Uh, now I can say that my principal strains for this body are just my, my center point plus and minus my, the radius of my circle. So epsilon 1 and 2 are that center plus and minus the radius. We can figure this out in another way, also using strain transformations. So you remember I had shown a couple strain transformation relationships yesterday. The I don't know if I want to write them all out again. Uh, I'll write down one of them. So if I want to find the strain in a rotated coordinate system uh, relative to that, this is one half uh, epsilon x plus epsilon y, it's the same as what we had gotten for our uh, sh stress rotation. One half epsilon x minus epsilon y cosine two theta plus gamma xy over two sine two theta. Um, and there's another one for the rotated stress in the y, in the new y direction and the new shear in that direction. What I can do is take these relationships, say that for principal strains, I only have epsilon one and epsilon two, and there's no shear, and say the, and relate my strain in some x direction here, actually. So now I want to relate this to, to the strain that I'm going to read out in a strain gauge in one of my rosettes. So my epsilon a, I'm going to say is one half related to my principles, epsilon one, epsilon two, plus one half uh, epsilon one minus epsilon two cosine of two. Uh, I'm gonna use theta p here. I think in the notes I might have used phi, but here now this is that distance theta p, I guess two theta p uh, from my, from my uh, principal strain. <laughs> My epsilon b, there's another relationship. This would be the y one. Uh, epsilon one plus epsilon two plus one half epsilon one minus epsilon two. And I know now my a and my b are 45 degrees apart from each other. 
So I can say this is cosine of 2 theta p plus 45 degrees. And my epsilon c, similarly, is 1 half epsilon 1, epsilon 2, 1 half epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2, cosine of 2, and this is now 90 degrees relative to my strain gauge. So I can use these three relationships, uh, do a whole bunch of funky algebra, some inverse cosines, some manipulation around to figure out what my principal strains are in terms of my uh, epsilon a, b, and c, and what my uh, principal strain directions are relative to my a, b, and c. So when I do that, what I end up with What I end up with is if I have my strains in my gauges A, B, and C, which is again what you're what you're getting out of the lab. There we go. Uh, I have my epsilon one and two are epsilon A plus epsilon C over two plus minus that square root of one half epsilon A minus epsilon B squared plus one half epsilon b minus epsilon c squared, which is the same as my uh, c minus r for the Mohr circle. The, then I can say my angle, my theta p relative to this is one half uh, a tan or tangent inverse, whichever I want to do inverse tangent of, this one's a little bit longer, a minus 2b plus c over a minus c. There we go. So now for a general strain gauge rosette oriented on the body, you can figure out from these two relationships what the principal strains are in the body and what the angle between your rosette and your principal strains are relative to your strain gauge A in this case. Does this only hold if the rosette is on a configuration 0, 3, 5, and Yes. It would change up uh, if it was so so that analysis is using is basically algebraing these equations and figuring out theta and uh, theta and, and epsilon one and two relative to these three. If it was at different orientations, you could say 60 and 120 or 120 and 240 here. And do the same type of analysis, but you would end up with slightly different results. Yeah. Oh, uh, if it's a two-dimensional plane, then why do we need three to be able to define it rather than two strain gauges? Because if we only had two strain gauges, remember that they're only measuring things axially. So this is, if I want to think about this in a more circle sense, I'm only measuring out two points on here. So I'd only measure out an epsilon A and an epsilon B, uh, where this is epsilon gamma over two. So if I only have these two points, I could have anything existing along these lines. So that means those might be the principal strains, in which case I would have a circle here. Those could not be the principal strains, in which case I would have a circle here. Those are both valid solutions if I only have two axis points. Basically, I need three points to define a circle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we need those three gotcha. gauges. Cool. More questions on stuff. <coughs> all right. I don't know if you're all as asleep today, or this is all stuff you've seen before. It's just really boring. How was the lab yesterday for those who had it? Still good? Cool. Who's who's actually started doing the, the write-up for the lab, or doing the analysis for the lab? <laughs> One, maybe two people. Cool, cool. Uh, I would recommend starting on this early. 
I would expect in total the write up to take around ten hours, um, as like a as like a good average. It depends on how comfortable you are with with beam <coughs> bending and uh, all the transformation equations. It's especially for people who have it due on Monday. Uh, we won't you won't be able to ask TAs or me anything on that weekend. So the TA recitation on Friday will be that chance for you to ask questions. So I would recommend at least starting looking at things and thinking about things before the recitation on Friday. Um, okay. So let's start talking about straight, uh, blah, isotropic stiffness now. Over to, okay. So now we talked about stress, we gave a general definition and how to transform it. We've talked about strain, gave a general definition, how to transform it. Remember the strain that we're using is all infinitesimal, so small strain. And I showed a little bit of the math about why that works the way that it does. Um, but now those two kind of exist independently. The big question for mechanics is how do those two relate to each other? So we're gonna talk about elasticity. And specifically here, we're going to be talking about first isotropic elasticity. Uh, isotropic So in general, elasticity or, or any, any figure that relates to physical quantities is known as a, as a constitutive relationship or a constitutive equation. So here, my elastic relationship it's called a, a constitutive relationship. Meaning it's, it's relating stress to strain. Uh, plasticity, viscoelasticity are all also all constitutive equations. This is kind of just the simplest equation we can come up with. So elasticity, in elasticity, we're gonna assume linear elastic relationships between stress and strain. So whatever I do to uh, stress, stress will linearly and directly proportionally relate to the strain. And for isotropic elasticity, I, I mentioned it in the beginning of the class, isotropic means it's the same in every direction. So for isotropic elasticity, if we look at like Young's modulus, for example, my x, my Young's modulus in the x direction is equal to that in the y direction is equal to that in the z direction is just some Young's modulus. Uh, next week and for your tension lab, we'll be working a little bit with carbon fiber composites. So I'll talk about anisotropic elasticity, uh, but right now we'll just go through isotropic elasticity, which is something you should have seen before, I think in CE 220 or whatever equivalent class you had on mechanics. Um, but how about, is there anybody who hasn't seen say Hooke's law in 3D? which is what we'll be talking about right now. Or who forgot what Hooke's Law in 3D is. Okay. <laughs> so you've at least seen it before, whether or not you remember it. Cool. So for this relationship, we're going to assume isotropic and homogeneous materials. So that means if I have some blob, it's all uniform, and all the properties are the same in every direction. It doesn't matter how this blob is oriented. So. Uh, a couple quick relationship or a couple quick reminders. So we talked in the beginning for isotropic elasticity, there's a whole bunch of elastic constants, Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, bulk, shear, and Lame constant. There, if you know two of them, you know all of them. Uh, and there's a few convenient relationships between them. So our, our bulk modulus G is E over two times one plus nu, our, our shear modulus. Our bulk modulus is E over three times one minus two nu, and our Lame constant, which we'll actually finally get to use here, uh, is nu E over one plus nu one minus two nu. So now I want you to think about, so we're, we're gonna take this back to uniaxial stretching, and then we'll use that to go forward into Hooke's Law in 3D. So if I take a body and I stretch it out, 
uh, in one, or I apply a stress in one direction. I know that body is going to stretch in the direction that I'm pulling on it, and it's going to thin out in the other two directions. So I can say here, if I apply some stress, I'll get a corresponding strain where my, my strain will be E epsilon in the direction, uh, or my, I guess my strain will be sigma over E in that direction. Let's switch that up. I'll get some strain epsilon over E in that direction. Uh, and then in the other two directions, I'll get a, a contraction that I relate using a Poisson's ratio. So my Poisson's ratio nu, uh, I get a negative these two, the contraction here is my negative nu epsilon over E. So I say it's going to stretch out relative to the Young's modulus in that direction, and it's going to contract relative to the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio in the other direction. So I want to set this up as a table for if I apply a stress in any arbitrary direction. So if I now say apply, uh, I want to use another piece of paper. Yeah, I'm just gonna use another. So now I'm going to say, is that even? Uh, I'm just going to. So now if I apply a stress, so uh, applied stress, if I apply some stress, sigma x in the x direction, I want to look at what my corresponding strains are that I'm going to get out. Epsilon uh, y and epsilon z. And I know in, my, in the same direction that I'm applying stress, I'm going to get that is uh, sigma over e. In the other two directions, I'm going to get minus nu sigma over e minus nu sigma over e. Now, similarly, if I apply stress in the other two directions, y and z, sigma z, I'm going to get the same thing, same sort of thing, where this is now in the direction that I'm applying stress, I'm going to get that stretch over the Young's modulus, z over e, and then this is going to be a minus nu uh, sigma y over e y over e nu sigma z over e nu sigma z over e. Uh, if I apply a shear stress, so uh, now I'm going to jump back to my other piece of paper. Uh, there we go. Cool. If I apply a shear stress to a body, oh, this is not. Gamma tau. If I apply that shear stress or x y, I'm going to get some corresponding gamma over g shear only in that direction that I'm applying. Yes. Uh, this would be how much it's straining in the opposite direction. Yeah. I feel like I mixed that up now for some reason. Did I mix it up? Why is this? Ugh. I'm getting a strain that's proportional to my sigma over E. Sorry kind of running with things right now. I'm getting a strain here that's minus nu sigma over e, which I wrote down in my table correctly. My bad. Totally mixing stuff up here. Yes. Um, which would be, I guess, inverse to what I had had before. And this is also... 
G gamma. Uh, yes. No. Yeah. Or I can say I get a shear that's equal to my tau over G. Oh man. It's been a long week. Too much. Sorry about that. Cool. So, I apply a shear in some direction and I get a corresponding shear strain that's proportional to the shear modulus, but I don't get a shear in any other direction. So, when I have now an applied shear, I can write this also out in a table where I have sigma xy, sigma uh, xz, sigma yz, in the direction that I'm applying my strain. So gamma xy, gamma xz, gamma yz. I'm getting some sigma xy over g, sigma xz over g, sigma yz over g, but I'm not getting anything in any other direction. So it's only, it's not resulting in any applied axial strain, and it's not resulting in any strain in any other direction. Uh, there are materials that do couple them, and we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit next week. Cool. So, now, if I want to figure out a general relationship or a general set of equations for, if I, for some applied stress on the body, what strain I'm going to get out, I can basically sum all of the columns in each of these and say now I can figure out if I apply some stress I can figure out what the strain in the body is as 1 over E I'm going to pull some stuff out um, sigma x minus nu sigma y plus sigma z and so this is just this is just taking the sum of the stresses along this column. I can do the same thing for the other two directions. Sigma y, 1 over e, uh, y minus nu, x, z, epsilon z, 1 over e, sigma z minus nu, x, plus sigma y and then my shear components are gamma xy is equal to sigma 1 over g or sigma xy over g gamma y x z sigma x z over g gamma y z and sigma y z over G. So this now, before we just had our, our uniaxial stress strain relationship, sigma is E epsilon, but now I don't want to just consider my stress in one dimension. I want to consider my, or my strain in one dimension. I want to consider my strain and my stress in all three dimensions of the body. And so this is also particularly relevant for the beam bending lab that you'll be doing, or that you are doing this week. So now, from theory, what you're going to have from beam bending, for example, is you'll have some axial stress and some shear stress in the body. You'll need to then correlate that to the strain in different directions. So for the lab, for example, you know you'll have along the top of the beam some axial, <coughs> some axial tension or compression along the top, tension along the bottom of the beam, some shear along the neutral axis, um, and then that will couple into other directions to give you strain in other directions. So even though you're only applying an axial stress or an axial tension along the beam axis, you'll still have strains in other directions in the beam. So this set of equations, even though uh, you may want to say there's no strain in any opposite direction, you have to think about how the stresses in each direction are affecting strains in the opposite directions. Is that from the material makeup of the beam, like inconsistencies in the structures of the when you have like different forces or tension going in opposite directions? Uh, what do you mean? Like if you were to 
like in a beam bending lab, why would you have a tension going like parallel with the with the support or something, you know? You don't have a uh, stress in that direction, but you have a strain. So the body the body changes shape in reaction to the force. And it's actually so we're assuming the the simplest case, which is homogeneous isotropic, which isn't necessarily the case, but for engineering materials, it's generally good enough. But it's uh, the reason it contracts is a, is it's a volume conservation. Volume con if I I want the volume of the body in elastically to stay mostly constant, and so if I stretch it out, it just has to thin out in the other two directions. That's why I'm getting a, a reaction strain in an opposite directions. So even though I'm not applying a load transverse to the beam, I still get a reaction strain transverse to the beam. Yeah. Um, are these equations only for small deformations like we talked about? Uh, yes, but the oh, it's, it's linear elastic deformation, which okay. is generally small. If you, does it still apply? I think it does. It, these these would still apply for finite strain as long as it was elastic, as long as it was linear elastic finite strain. Okay. So you would still be able to use these relationships, but the problem is the strains would get kind of wonky. Would we be just using these with the equations that we were talking about yesterday? We would just kind of plug them into uh, as replacements. Yes, but it gets a little bit more complicated and generally you have to do the analysis numerically um, because I, I don't think I've even actually done finite strain um, analytically before. It's just kind of something you would do with a numerical algorithm because it gets too complicated to start doing by hand. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so that's here. It's it's this uh, relationship here. So the way that I measure shear modulus is by taking a body, shearing it in one direction and measuring how much it distorts in that same direction. So I have uh, a tau is equal to g gamma, where gamma I'm defining as this relationship for a body, like just the amount that it shears there. But in my engine, when I'm looking at actual shear in um, my shear stress, shear strain uh, as a as a in this matrix formulation, I want these to be symmetric, and so I, I this the strain here isn't necessarily symmetric. So what I do is I, I would effectively rotate my body <coughs> by a half a gamma. So instead of saying it's it's shearing <coughs> gamma this direction, I'm shearing, I'm saying it's going gamma this direction and gamma back. Or gamma over two and gamma over two the other way, and so I average it out, and so I say my my shear strain is half of my engineering shear strain. It's a convention that gets really confusing, and this is actually the context that it's important to know about because knowing which whether you're using engineering or normal shear strain, uh, basically you'd have an extra factor of two in here that you would calculate or that would, you would be using incorrectly depending on how it's being defined. So these like gamma xy is like half of the regular gamma. Uh, yeah, so I could say this is also um, 2 epsilon xy. Oh. So gamma xy is 2 epsilon xy is sigma xy over g. Yeah. This, it, it's probably still going to be confusing. I also constantly get mixed up on it, um, but it is something important to remember. So uh, now, if I so now I, I have a relationship between strain and stress, and I want to figure out what the opposite relationship is. This one or this this set of equations is I think all that you'll need for the beam bending lab. Uh, but it's also useful to have them going in the opposite direction. So you can do that mathematically. It's a big inversion problem uh, with a whole lot of algebra that I'm not going to go through, but I'm going to give you the 
final solution. So I would invert these equations to end up with now my relationship for stress in terms of strain. So if I had a body and I knew what shape it had changed into and I knew what the elastic constants were, I'd be able to figure out what the stress is. Uh, and this, I can say my xx is, oh, this is going to be a big long one, xx over uh, 1 plus nu plus nu e over 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu. This now is epsilon x plus epsilon y plus epsilon z. And now I want to simplify this. So I'm actually going to pull on those relationships that I had mentioned. So by uh, these transformations the between shear and, and shear modulus and Lemay's constant. I'm going to also use a simplification to say, uh, do you all know what the trace of a matrix is? Have you heard of that? So if I, if I have the trace of a matrix, trace of, um, let's just say, A, B, C, T, E, F, G, H, I, the trace of that matrix is the sum of the diagonals. This is just A plus E plus I. So now this epsilon xx, y, y, and zz is actually just the trace of my and of my uh, stress of my strain matrix, and I can rewrite this whole thing now. This is my shear modulus, or two times my shear modulus, two g epsilon xx plus lambda times the trace of my strain, or it's just xx plus yy plus zz. So this is finally where that Lemay's constant comes in, um, is in simplifying my relationship for uh, stress and strain. I can write out all the other equations. I can say um, now my y x is just 2g epsilon y plus lambda trace of epsilon my z is 2g x, uh, z plus lambda trace of epsilon uh, the shear modulus shear moduli are also pretty simple. It's, I mean, you're just moving a g over, so you don't really have to do much to invert that. Um, but sigma xy is g gamma xy, which is our definition of shear modulus anyway. Yes? Uh, do we know what the trace of epsilon is, or is that just being used for simplicity's sake? So, so you would use these equations if you knew what the strain in a body was. So say I, I knew what my strain matrix was, and I then want to figure out what the stress in that body is. Okay. It's not something you do as often, um, because experimentally, normally, you would be, you would be measuring forces, right. although there are cases, like for digital image correlation, where you get a strain distribution from the way that parts are deforming. Or like with strain gauges, you're getting strains from the, from the strain gauges and then you would want to measure what the stress is from that experimentally. Okay. So here you would you would know what your strains were right. in the body, uh, and then you would be using that to back calculate stress. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering about the replacement of the tr using the trace. Uh, ah. is, this, is that just making it easier to write? Or? It's just making it easier to write. It's the, these are the same, same thing. thing. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense, thank you. Yeah, just for simplified notation. So, so this is the, oh, where do I, uh, I guess the full thing out is that x, y, z, x, y, x, z, y, z, and then this is symmetric, so these are the same on the op opposite side. Yeah, or you would get... Uh, so it, 
from the rosette, you're only getting two dimensions because it's only on a surface. Got it. Uh, and then you would have to have it have to have a rosette on another plane to figure out what the strain in that direction was. But you can't really. You'd have to have a, if you wanted to measure the strain in the through direction, you'd have to have a caliper um, or a clip gauge or, or something. Yeah. So we're not doing that necessarily for this lab. Yeah. Cool. So we have a few minutes left. I'm going to now ask you all a conceptual question. Yeah. Yes. So those in the in the lab, we should be giving you the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio of okay. aluminum, which are like sixty nine GPA and point three three, something like that. Also, have the notes that. So the, the lecture notes and the lecture videos that I've been posting been helpful? Those are good. Okay, cool. So uh, in the last few minutes, I'm going to have you guys do a poll everywhere thing. And this one, I, I want you to think about what the shape of a beam is when it's bending. So this is also direct re directly relevant for your beam bending lab. Yeah, L M E Z A. Um, and so this now relates to, so we're, we're only applying a load to the midpoint and I guess two point loads on the sides of the beam. And that can, from that we can figure out with beam bending theory what our, what our stresses are based on the moments. But that doesn't necessarily dictate what the strains in the body are. So I want you to think about if I, if I push this down and I, and I look at the cross section of the beam, what then is that cross sectional shape gonna be? Um, I'll have you answer now based on what you think it's going to be. Then I'll go back, have you talk to neighbors for a couple minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss it. Okay, now I'm going to give you guys maybe a minute or two to talk about, talk through it with your neighbors. Okay, so who wants to give their reason that they had talked about and kind of give some rationale for why, why it might take on a certain shape?
Mm -hmm. So that would lead to the third option. Okay. So the so the compression would go to that, and the tension would go to that. Okay. Uh, who else wants to give it a shot? I used the same logic, but I chose the trapezoid up. Okay. Yeah. Because compression on the top would indicate that it would go up, which would bottom would actually. Okay. So, <laughs> so, the so the compression on the top instead of. So remember that this is a cross section here. So we're, we're now looking at the, the cross plane kind of expanded over. And so tension would then, or compression would then make the out of point direction squeeze out and the uh, tension direction squeeze in. Oh, wait, these are cross sections? Yes. So this is like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm cutting this thing and looking at the exposed face. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So, the yes. So the trapezoid up is is the right, or in this case, the right answer. It's also I I think maybe a better way to think uh, a, a more tricky question would have been: Is this actually a straight line or is it a curved line trapezoid? Because the the concave and convex ones don't have curvature there too but uh, why why would it be a straight line along that trapezoid face why or why might it be instead of a curved line along the trapezoid face if it's long and narrow enough of a beam so that the the uh, shear stresses are a lot larger than the uh, almost, almost. Okay. <laughs> stress was a linear function of the yeah. So because we're assuming stress is linear throughout the cross section of the beam, so we're assuming it's linear across this way, where along the neutral plane it's not going to stretch or, or it's not going to expand or contract at all. Uh, and then along the top and bottom, it'll linearly change because of that linear stress relationship. Okay. Uh, cool. So fun stuff to think about for the lab. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have, and I'll see you all on Friday. Oh, I also have office hours today, if anyone's interested in coming. And, right, I, uh, I posted the homework for this week. It'll be due the following Wednesday in class.